Dune is such an incredibly cool universe, beloved by science fiction and fantasy fans alike. And it spawned quite a lot of media. There's the 1984 movie that is, well, you know, it's okay. It's certainly stylish and uses its artistic license. There's the Sci-Fi Channel's miniseries, and soon there will be a new blockbuster movie. All of these, of course, come from the series of novels written by Frank Herbert and later expanded on by his son, Brian. The story of Dune is very cool, and this inevitably led to several video games. However, Dune has disappeared, and the last time we saw a Dune game was 20 years ago. Since then, nothing. So what kind of games were produced in the Dune universe, and why haven't we seen one lately? Allow me to provide a very, very brief synopsis of the plot. Dune takes place thousands of years in the future where mankind has successfully managed to colonize the stars. Humanity is a galactic empire, but the story will focus primarily on three families. The Atreides, the Harkonnen, and the Emperor himself. The Atreides, who come from a utopian planet, are sent to become the administrators of the Empire's most valuable planet, Arrakis, colloquially referred to as Dune. The Harkonnens use this transition period in order to sow discord and assassinate members of the Atreides family, sending the key protagonist, Paul Atreides, out into the desert. Out in this desert, Paul meets the desert people, the Fremen, and eventually becomes their leader, and then leads a revolt against the Harkonnens and the Emperor himself. The story wraps itself up in politics, and the expansion of human potential delves into drugs and altered states of consciousness, shared memories, and questions of colonialism and tribal culture, mixing healthy doses of Arabian history into 1960s Zen thinking. The core part of this story is a focus on the spice melange, a psychotropic super drug that allows people to see the future, engage in telepathy, and more, all while tasting like cinnamon and only being found on Arrakis. This superdrug may be the universe's most valuable substance, but the never-ending scheming and fighting around control of the spice isn't really the main aspect of the story. It's a story about humanity and the need for space, and makes a lot of very damning statements about cities and cramped living and abuse of the environment. The human question is not how many can possibly survive within the system, but what kind of existence is possible for those who do survive. If you were going to make a game about this, what kind of game would you even make? Well, for the people who got that opportunity, it seemed obvious to them that Dune is a strategy game. In 1992, Cryo Interactive released Dune, a hybrid adventure strategy game that places you in the shoes of Paul Atreides. Cryo's Dune is somewhat unique in that it may be the only game to ever be adapted from a novel as accurately as it is. Rather than making a game and fitting the source material around the bones of gameplay, instead they molded the gameplay to fit the story. This means you'll spend the beginning of the game wandering the halls of your family's estate on Arrakis interacting with people like an adventure game. Dune does some very forward-thinking things that we didn't actually see in other games for a long time, and here is where one of those immediately pops up. A party system. You can invite people you speak with to join your party, and they can provide context-specific assistance, such as finding hidden rooms, allowing you to recruit additional Fremen, 
training those Fremen, and providing new conversation paths. This is something very similar to Bioware-style RPGs. Dune adds on to this by having a first-person flight system, where you can jump into a thopter and travel and explore the world. Think Fallout 2's car system, except you can just keep going until you circumnavigate the entire planet, because the world here is round. A round world also means day-night cycle, and yes, that's here too. You can literally just sit and watch the sunrise over the desert, or enjoy a late-night stroll through the dunes of Dune. Everything in the game is played out in real time, so as you send your orders out and start seeing your forces respond to your commands, you might find yourself with some time to kill, so you just go flying around. This real-time, open-world concept is pretty far forward from anything else we'd see for a long time. And once you add in the companion system, man, this game is pretty crazy advanced. That's even before we get into the actual strategy side of the game, which consists of allocating your troops to specialize in spice production, military, or ecological specializations, all in service of your ultimate goal. Destroy the Harkonnen in a military coup. You'll improve your troops through training, smart usage of your companions, and even army-specific items that you can equip units with. And while the game is rather linear, owing to its near-slavish interest at close adaptation of the original novel, you can go beyond what the story told and begin terraforming Dune using the ecological specialization and the water supplies hoarded by the Fremen. The mind-blowing aspect here is that this ecological improvement does, as is hinted at in the story, affect the generation of spice on the planet. Meaning that you can choose to make the world a better place, but if you do so, you're affecting your long-term profitability and ruining the generation of the most valuable substance in the universe. This was always a core part of the novel, that the poor were trodden upon and forced to live worse lives in order to allow for this special spice to be harvested. And that it's included in this game is crazy. You can even use terraforming as a weapon of war to turn your enemy's lands barren of spice and force them to abandon their outposts. Calling this game progressive is an understatement. The same year as Cryo's Dune, Westwood Studios released Dune 2, ostensibly a sequel, but in reality completely different from the adventure strategy hybrid. Dune 2 is not the first real-time strategy. That honor belongs to Herzog Zwei, or Duke 2, a game created for the Sega Genesis in 1989. However, it's Dune 2's DNA you find in all future RTS games, following through Command & Conquer, the Blizzard Craft games, and even into the modern day with Dota. It sets the standard for what RTS should be, and is usually considered to be the most influential Dune game. Describing Dune 2 sounds remarkably basic simply because of how many norms it set. You choose from one of three armies and battle for control of the planet, harvesting resources and using those to build buildings and units through a multi-mission campaign, each level of which starts you with a new base that you must build upon, expand out into the fog of war, and then destroy that level's enemies. There are even multiple endings for each army. The game was one of the first to use MIDI for music, and there's even a Sega Genesis version of the game with additional art and improved gameplay. Dune 2 is pretty hard to play today, simply because it was designed for DOS, and this is what would lead Westwood to update it in a new iteration called Dune 2000. 
2000 was released in 1998 as the next big strategy game from Westwood Studios after Command & Conquer Red Alert. Essentially a reimagining or retelling of Dune 2, 2000 doesn't really change much from Dune 2, it's just prettier. In all ways as well, the sprites are gorgeous, the backgrounds feel dusty, and the animated cutscenes have been replaced by digitally enhanced actors. These are really the highlight of this game. With John Reese davis Gimli from The Lord of the Rings, putting in a perfectly serviceable performance. This version would be ported to the PlayStation, but is otherwise unremarkable, except for the fact that this is the one game that's easiest to play today, including multiplayer. Open RA is a fan-made recreation of Dune 2000, Command & Conquer, and Red Alert, and provides a modernized, free, and completely unendorsed way to play the games. Most importantly, you can play Dune 2000 in an almost completely authentic way, and also destroy your friends. Westwood would finish out their Dune trilogy with Emperor, which is set after the events of Dune 2, and yet also confusingly set 200 years before the events of the novel. And you play again as the commander of an army through a multi-mission campaign. What is interesting about this game, however, is that instead of a set campaign with specific levels, you instead choose the next map you want to fight on through a dynamic war map, something you might have seen also in Galaxy at War. This balancing act of defense and attack and the ability to lose a mission without losing the game is a big improvement to the life cycle of the RTS mixed in with Westwood's now standard live action cutscenes. The game is 3D, putting itself up against other 3D RTSs at the time, such as Ground Control and Earth 2150. But other than this, you won't find much new in Emperor. This leads us to the last game, Frank Herbert's Dune, released in 2001 by Cryo Interactive, the same Cryo that created the original Dune game in 1992. This was a Hail Mary. Cryo was in debt after a decade of increasingly bizarre adventure games such as The Secret of Nautilus and Hellboy Dogs of the Night, both of which took serious liberties with their licenses and ended up being lambasted in reviews. The debts inevitably piled up, and their hope was this Dune game might rekindle their company. Unfortunately, By this point, Dune was a strategy game, not an adventure game, the original being completely overshadowed by Westwood's iteration. Cryo gave it their all, creating a new story that takes place during a two-year gap in the novel story, but ultimately, this was an adventure game in the days when adventure games were dying. After poor reviews and poor sales, Cryo would shut down. Another casualty of Cryo's failure was Dune Generations, a MMO RTS that's massively multiplayer online real-time strategy, which sounds as bonkers as you can imagine. Today, MMO generally is understood to be an RPG, but as an RTS, you would start on your own planet, rise in power against the local militias before going on to fight in a perpetual universe, with the goal being to control Arrakis and the Spice, create alliances, garner influence, and engage in direct warfare across the galaxy in an attempt to please the Emperor, or just be a mercenary and take on warfare jobs from more passive traitor players. The idea of a space-based dynastic politics game with resource management and military development would be realized by EVE Online. But even that doesn't really touch on being a commander in charge of an entire house and its military. And Arrakis playing on Dune, being the family 
gifted control would have seen you enter into a completely different game, managing diplomatic relations with Fremen tribes and actively working to harvest and deliver the spice to the Emperor and the galaxy. I can't help but question the idea of spending so many resources developing a game where the goal is to fight amongst thousands of others for the mere chance to eventually be the one player who gets to control Arrakis. And God knows how many resources they dumped into developing an entire subsection of gameplay that only a few players would ever see. Ultimately, we would never find out, as Frank Herbert's Dune would crash Cryo into insolvency. As Cryo died, so too died its plans for generations. It was certainly a unique concept, something vast and ambitious. And while I think there are serious concerns about how it would have played, it also would have been fascinating to see. So why haven't there been any new Dune games? I have two answers for you. One, people don't really play these kind of games anymore. It's hard enough to convince a developer to make a strategy game or RPG, and harder still if you add on an expensive media license to it. It's likely that most of the games in this genre that are produced today make a pretty small profit, and if you cut into that to pay for the name Dune, well, you're probably not profitable anymore. Add to this the fact that Westwood is basically the only company to make a successful Dune game, and they they were so staunchly cemented in the real-time strategy mold that they couldn't see a game outside of that, leading to sequels that barely iterated on the original. But why couldn't we have different kinds of Dune games? Well, we do have really good Dune games. They're just not called Dune. They're called Star Wars. Star Wars is so closely based on Dune that Herbert is rumored to have considered lawsuits, and Lucas openly admitted to influences from the book. Arrakis is Tatooine, moisture farmers and dew collectors, sand crawlers and spice factories, sarlaccs and sandworms, spice and empires, Princess Leia and Princess Alia, the Force and the Voice, Han Solo and Duncan Idaho, and even the fact that the hero is the descendant of the villain. Yes, long before Luke was Vader's son, Paul was a Harkonnen. It's shocking how similar these stories are, even as they diverged later. So why didn't we get a great Dune game? Because they were all turned into Star Wars games instead. Thank you for sharing this video, and if you'd like to watch another, you can do that right here. And as always, I'll see you on the next one.